Veteran surgeon said he hacked around inside people's bodies like a hyperactive child wielding a scalpel. He left people paralyzed, he cut through arteries and didn't seem to care as blood flowed like a fountain. He maimed and killed and he was still allowed to operate. How on earth did this happen? That's what we're going to find out today. Christopher Dunch's surgeries were so bad, so utterly disturbing in their seemingly pathological neglect of human life and human suffering, that some people who witnessed his surgical disasters thought he must have been a sociopathic imposter. But Mr. Dunch was a real surgeon. It wasn't as if he'd gotten his qualifications from the University of the Spaghetti Monster degree mill. He wasn't a complete imposter, but as you'll see, he was a sociopath. Dunch was born in Montana in 1971 and was brought up in Memphis, Tennessee. He and his three siblings were well taken care of. Their pop, a physical therapist, and mom, the teacher, gave their children everything they needed. Importantly though, Christopher was the eldest sibling. He had something to prove to Nathan, Matt, and Liz, and his parents. He wasn't lacking in talent in high school, being quite smart and showing a fairly high degree of skill in football. In fact, that's what he wanted to do at first, play football. But in college, even though he seemed to train harder than many of the other players, he just didn't cut the mustard. That was failure number one. The buds of his insecurity started growing and they were filled with poison. It's true that he attained an undergraduate degree in 1995 from Memphis State University. It's also true that he enrolled at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center to take on a difficult qualification that combined an MD and a PhD. He then did a neurosurgical residency, but something went wrong there. Instead of completing the usual 1,000 operations that are usually undertaken, he did around 100, although he was there for five years. So on paper, it was looking as though Dunch was doing everything right, despite the lack of training. He could now put an MD on his resume, but he also later added a doctorate in microbiology from St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. St. Jude didn't even run that program. Success was more important than telling the truth. That was becoming evident. He also raised millions of dollars for research regarding stem cells and their application for curing injury and disease, and on the back of two Russian scientists' research, he created two companies. The husband of the husband and wife team of Russian scientists would later say in regard to the discoveries, it wasn't his invention, it was the invention of me and my wife, because we all made primary experiments. We discovered it. By the time he started hacking at people's spines, he had a CV that was 12 pages long. To some that looked at it, they thought, what hasn't this guy done? He'd studied, worked in research, and trained for around 15 years. He seemed vastly employable. Little did most people know that Christopher Dunch could add to that CV, perhaps, in the hobbies and interests section, avid consumer of recreational drugs with preference for LSD and cocaine, especially cocaine. Dunch, often with a childhood pal Jerry Summers, would get high all night and then he'd go to work with his mind adequately frazzled while wearing dirty scrubs. Summers put his neck on the line for Dunch many times in the figurative sense, and once, unfortunately, in the literal sense. Dr. Death went to work on Summer's neck injury that left the best friend a quadriplegic. Summers trusted him, but he had no idea his buddy was far from the outstanding surgeon he pretended to be. From his wheelchair, Summers later said, before my surgery, I didn't know any bad outcomes that he had. A real surgeon later remarked on the surgery saying, Jerry Summers was effectively decapitated during the operation. He died in 2021 as a result of his condition. It's now time we talk more about Dunch's horrific operations. He was forced out of his company and then sued. He was now in debt. He also had a significant problem with the devil's dandruff, so he used that qualification spangled CV to land himself a job as a neurosurgeon at the Baylor Regional Medical Center. His salary was $600,000 a year. The problem was, as you know, but they didn't know, he wasn't really qualified to work on spines. Nonetheless, a vascular surgeon named Randall Kirby, who'd later file a complaint against Dunch, said all he heard Dunch do was brag about how great a surgeon he was. It was as if he talked a good game but played a very bad one. Kenneth Fennell was Dunch's first patient. He was left paralyzed and was only able to walk a short distance with a cane after a lot of rehabilitation. The operation wasn't a difficult one at all for a qualified surgeon. With patient Lee Passmore, Dunch cut through a ligament that was way off where he should have been cutting. He also put a screw in the wrong place, which he twisted so much he stripped the thread so he couldn't take it back out. When Passmore's two young kids and his friend turned up at the hospital and aired their concern, Dunch looked at him and said, don't worry about it. Passmore now says he has no feeling in his feet, and there are times when he's incontinent. People who were there for the operation could not believe what they'd seen, but hey, this was a new guy with that amazing CV. We won't go into every patient, but suffice to say, Dunch was dangerous. He used the wrong surgical tools and hacked at nerves and bones. He cut through a major artery in one woman and blood spouted into the air. He was told she might die during the operation, but he just carried on as if nothing happened. The patient did eventually die. 
Something like this might happen once in a lifetime for a surgeon, but it wouldn't happen a few times in such a short period. People can die during surgery, but not usually as a result of total absolute negligence. To onlookers in the operating room, Dunch seemed about as skilled at surgery as you would be after watching a few YouTube videos on spine surgery. He was accused of being drunk on the job, but when his blood was tested for alcohol, he passed. Still, a friend later said that Dunch would party all night on booze and cocaine and then just waltz into work to perform possibly life-changing surgeries. She said, I thought it was pretty amazing that he was even able to get to work the next day, like he wasn't scared. How did he not get arrested or at least fired then and there? That's the big question, and it's now one a lot of Americans are asking since they don't want their bodies ruined by a crazed surgeon. Dunch did have his surgical privileges revoked at that first hospital, and he was reviewed, but to prevent an expensive legal battle, the hospital allowed him to resign rather than risk getting sued by him for unfair dismissal. That's how it all went wrong, stage one. He started working at Dallas Medical Center and was granted some privileges to perform surgeries. The hospital still wanted to hear from Baylor and so wouldn't yet grant Dunch full privileges. He didn't get those privileges because within one week of being there, he killed a woman named Floella Brown after cutting through her vertebral artery. The next day, he operated on Mary Eford and wanted to drill into her head even though he wasn't qualified to do so. He put screws in the wrong place, he severed her nerves, and he didn't remove the disc he was supposed to remove. In short, he went at her like a child in the game operation, and there were lots of beeps. In this case, the beeps were his colleagues saying, what the hell are you doing? Some of them later said they thought he was high. When another surgeon, Robert Henderson, went in to try to correct the damage, he said it looked like Dunch had been playing with Tinker Toys. He called the operation an assault. In fact, he was so shocked at what he saw, he said this man has to be an imposter. No surgeon in the world, the entire world, could make a mess like that. Nonetheless, since Dunch was only there on a temporary basis, the hospital didn't have to report him. That could be a hassle, so Dunch just moved on. As you now realize, while he is the outright villain of this story, some blame can be put on the hospitals too. As Ponius Pilate did with Jesus, they washed their hands of him. Dunch managed to land more gigs at the Southampton Community Hospital in Dallas and at a clinic called the Legacy Surgery Center in Frisco, also in Texas. His ad hoc surgeries left one man without feeling in his right side and another man paralyzed from the neck down. Even with this huge tally of disaster to his name, he'd still walk around saying things like, everybody's doing it wrong, I'm the only clean, minimally invasive guy in the whole state. He operated on Jacqueline Troy, and as well as cutting through an artery, he severed her vocal cords. This kind of thing was unheard of in the history of modern surgery. Shortly after, with another patient, he thought a muscle was a tumor. He cut through the artery with this guy and again severed the vocal cords. Dr. Kirby, who we mentioned earlier, saw what happened. He couldn't believe his eyes. He called Dunch a maniac and said he was either trying to decapitate the patient or kill him some other way. He added that such reckless mistakes had never been seen in the history of U.S. medical care. And it's this man Kirby as well as Dr. Henderson that are the heroes of the story. They saw what was happening. Although as much as they warned people and complained to the hospitals, they couldn't get Dunch arrested or even have his license taken away from him. But then, at last, they finally managed to persuade the Texas Medical Board to suspend Dunch's license. Even then, Dunch was still trying to get his hands on more patients. He still believed he was the best out there, a delusion of grandeur likely a consequence of doing eight balls of cocaine during the evenings. That was evident in the emails he sent, which sounded like he was trying to come across as some kind of medical rapper. In one email, he wrote that he was the supernova sophisticated savant, and on top of the alliteration, he said, I do my thing, build my empire, party, and beep with models without knowing their names to make money. In yet another email, he was less lyrical, saying, Anyone close to me thinks that I am likely something between God, Einstein, and the Antichrist. In another email, he was more honest, stating, I am one of a kind, a mother beeping stone cold killer that can buy or own or steal or ruin or build whatever he wants. That would come back to bite him. The only thing he had in common with some rappers was his perpetual drug abuse, now with the added use of Oxycontin and Xanax, and a history of violence, although no rapper could touch him on his violence record. But Kirby rapped back, writing in a report that his doctor was a clear and present danger to the citizens of Texas. He and Henderson by this time had even gone back to where Dunch had done his residency and showed him a picture of him to his former supervisors. Kirby and Henderson thought someone had to be pretending to be Dunch. No one could be that bad. But it was him. There was no imposter. The people that had trained him said they knew of nothing to Dunch's detriment. This didn't ring true for the two surgeons. Henderson later said, could he have permanent brain damage from either chemicals or from some organic reason, meaning a tumor, or is this just a sociologic pathologic personality that has flipped and become a destroyer instead of a healer? 
Still, the board only suspended his license, not completely revoked it. What is going on here, thought Henderson and Kirby. There was enough evidence to prove that Dunch wasn't just the worst surgeon the world had ever seen, but that he was likely an outright psychopath with willingness to kill. Then a reporter in Dallas named Brett Schiff got hold of the story. He too couldn't believe what he'd found out. He also went after Dunch. The board subsequently asked a very well-respected surgeon to review Dunch's operations. He almost had an apoplectic fit reading about the bloody disasters. Just in one case alone, he said, there was enough proof to be certain that Dr. Dunch didn't know what he was doing. He said it was an impossibility for a neurosurgeon not to know when someone was bleeding out, as had happened with the Dunch one time. The board finally revoked the Dunch's medical license, but it had taken way too long for Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kirby. There was a reason. Henderson was recorded talking to one of the board's investigators when he asked her how could Dunch still be practicing. She answered, Sometimes we know that someone's bad, but when it comes to taking them to a hearing and proving it to where we can actually do some disciplinary action, it takes a time of gathering evidence. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes longer than we want. To write it did. There are people who'd still be walking if he'd been stopped earlier. We found other cases that involved malpractice by surgeons. They weren't anywhere near the levels of horrors committed by Dunch, but they too involved slow investigations. Kirby said with the Dunch, the action should have happened sooner. He was a special case, but maybe Dunch was so bad that no one could believe it. Kirby said in an interview, this is a once in a generation occurrence. We have someone off the rails this bad. This is why no one saw this coming. Also, let's remember that A-grade resume of Dunch's. Let's also recall that Dunch had an amazing marketing team. He appeared in TV commercials looking and sounding like a man you'd want to remove a disc from your back. Even if people looked at doctor's ratings on websites, he scored a 4.5 rating out of 5. A doctor like that is worth millions to hospitals that hired him, possibly 2.5 million bucks a year. Nonetheless, at least six doctors complained to the board about Dunch. Some of them were almost hysterical when they told the board that this man must be stopped. In December 2013, he finally was, but that didn't mean Dunch was behind bars, far from it. The lunatic was still on the loose. He was getting weirder, too. He moved to Denver, where in 2014 he was arrested for trying to get into the house of his ex-partner with whom he had a kid. Then he was arrested again for stealing stuff from Walmart worth $887.30. He shoplifted five pairs of sunglasses, a bunch of watches, some shoes, ties, some cologne, and a walkie-talkie. He was then broke. He had cracked, it seems, and was picked up one day by police wandering around and subsequently taken to a psychiatric hospital to be evaluated. He needed it. He was also picked up driving a car with two flat tires. That time he was charged with a DUI. One time again when trying to get close to his ex, she found him in her apartment covered in blood. Dressed in his scrubs, he told her he had a tussle with some medical investigators, but that wasn't true. We don't know what happened to him. In July 2015, he was indicted for causing an injury to an elderly person as well as five counts of assault. At the time of his arrest, he was staying at a hotel. Later in court, his lawyers argued that the fault lay with those who trained him, but that was a very weak defense. The prosecution pulled out some of his rapper-esque emails, showing the jury that stone-cold killer message. The jury was unanimous in saying that Dunch was guilty of intentionally or knowingly causing serious bodily injury to an elderly individual. Dunch made U.S. history, becoming the first surgeon to have been found guilty on criminal charges for his work. He was given that life sentence, but for some, there was a bigger problem than Dunch. One neurosurgeon said, the conditions which created Dr. Dunch still exist, thereby making it possible for another to come along. In total, he injured sometimes severely 33 out of 38 of his patients. Two people died as a result of his insane actions. Some victims were compensated for what had happened, but this wasn't about money. One of them said it was more about getting him off the streets. The public needs to know that there was a monster out there, the victim said. Unfortunately, as you watch this, some people are in a wheelchair or using crutches or are no longer in this world because a scalpel-wielding maniac was able to fool some people into thinking the devil didn't exist. Dunch will be eligible for parole in 2045, at which point he'll be 75. Now, you need to watch What If You Wake Up During Surgery or have a look at Doctors Do the Unthinkable, Removing the Wrong Body Parts.